Uh, great, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome as you make your way back uh, from lunch. Uh, if you're just joining us, uh, my name's Chris Griffin. I'm the Executive Director at the Foreign Policy Initiative. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this afternoon portion of FBI's annual Foreign and Defense Policy Conference. Uh, we'll start out this afternoon with a pair of deep dives, really, uh, first looking at the crisis in the Middle East uh, and then moving on after that to a panel discussion about Russia. Uh, that we could not have a more distinguished panel uh, with Ambassador Jim Jeffrey and Ambassador Robert Ford uh, to discuss uh, what we initially framed as the crisis in the Middle East at the beginning of the year, and as the year progressed, uh, we modified the title to be the chaos of the Middle East uh, to capture the true extent of the challenges that we face there. Um, to moderate this conversation, it's a pleasure to be joined by Kim Kagan, who is the founder and president of the Institute for the Study of War, uh, an organization whose work I could not more highly recommend uh, that you check out and, and valuable in our work, uh, and has also, in the course of her career, uh, spent more than 17 months advising U.S. commanders in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, is also uh, written a decisive history uh, of the war in Iraq that would highly commend. Uh, Kim. Thank you so much for joining us today to moderate this discussion. Well, thank you so much, Chris, and thanks to all of you who are here this afternoon. Um, and thanks uh, to those of you on our C-SPAN audience uh, who are following along. I have the pleasure of moderating a panel with two truly fine Americans uh, whom I have had the privilege to work with a little bit uh, as they served the United States overseas. Uh, first, Ambassador Jim Jeffrey, uh, who has been throughout his career, uh, a star player um, with the uh, Department of State, uh, but whom I got to know a little bit uh, when he was ambassador to Iraq. Uh, his storied career uh, includes just a number of wonderful posts. Um, he certainly uh, perhaps had a slightly better time as ambassador to Turkey than ambassador to Iraq, but I will let you make that call. He is now actually the uh, Philip Solon's Distinguished Visiting Fellow at the Washington Institute, and he writes marvelous work uh, on the contemporary Middle East and especially uh, my beloved Iraq. Ambassador Robert Ford, I also met in Iraq uh, when he was actually deputy chief of mission. Um, and he has recently retired from the Foreign Service after uh, a distinguished career in the Middle East. But uh, in particular, um, he was at the forefront of uh, the United States' assistance uh, to the Syrian people during the Syrian civil war. Um, he has really uh, been marvelous uh, as an advocate of the issues uh, that the Syrian people are facing and marvelous as an advocate of uh, policy in Syria uh, since retiring uh, from that, that particular job and joining the team at the Middle East Institute. So if you can join me in welcoming our two distinguished guests. Uh, let, me, let me start with a big overarching question that people ask me all the time, which is, uh, <laughs> gentlemen, uh, the this, this situation in the Middle East, the chaos in the Middle East, are we actually facing a hopeless challenge? Uh, how would you characterize the threats that actually face us uh, and the challenges that are actually before us, the United States? Uh, oh, first of all, thank you, Kim, for those kind words, and thank you to uh, uh, FBI for putting this on today and uh, welcome everybody and it's good to see so many uh, faces I recognize from various uh, prior chaos and crises in the Middle East. In fact, that's how I want to start uh, my answer. Uh, uh, I'm celebrating this fall my 40th anniversary of my first crisis and chaos in the Middle East when I and 300 million other American military personnel were put on immediate DEFCON 2 or 3 alert uh, with some of us about to go to uh, the Sinai because of the Yom Kippur War and the Soviet moves uh, to try to rescue the Egyptian Third Army. Uh, and since then, it's been a roller coaster ride. Certainly in much of my career, I've kept on trying to sneak away to the Balkans or to Germany and uh, fate and uh, the situation in the Middle East pulls me back. So my first theme is uh, this is a continuing 
crisis or situation, dysfunctional situation in the Middle East, and we need to know why it's a long-term problem. My second point that contradicts it is uh, this situation with ISIS uh, is a particular new and dangerous uh, situation. And let me uh, talk about the latter first, why I think that uh, uh, it has to be stopped, it has to be defeated, it has to be destroyed. Uh, those are the official words and uh, policy of the U.S. administration. We'll see whether they can achieve that. Uh, the reason is, first of all, unlike other movements uh, that it bears a lot of similarity to, and I'll get to that in just a sec, uh, it has seized a huge amount of terrain, somewhere between 7 and 9 million people. It has large military forces, a lot of equipment. It has control over economic things like despite our bombing and other actions, a fair amount of oil. Uh, and uh, it is threatening the very fabric uh, fabric of the center of the Middle East, uh, endangering what President Obama has repeatedly and correctly said are our four main interests in the region, our allies stopping weapons of mass destruction uh, uh, spread, uh, fighting terrorism, uh, and uh, taking care of allies, fighting terrorism, weapons of mass destruction, and I always forget the fourth one. Uh, I'll come back to the fourth one. Uh, but anyway, uh, you got the good ones. Uh, yeah, those, those are the good ones. Uh, but uh, we have really important, oh, the, how could I forget it, the free flow of oil. Uh, we have really important uh, issues in the Middle East that these guys are going to threaten if they're not destroyed. Uh, but how do they come about and what's the underlying uh, problem in the region? Uh, here I, I would quote uh, as much as I can uh, the recent work by Henry Kissinger, uh, world order, where he describes the Middle East as unique in the world because you have, from Pakistan all the way to Morocco, a set of very weak nation states without most of the roots in their populations and in history that nation states elsewhere, however weak they are in the Balkans or Central America, uh, appear to be. In that whole region, only a handful of states are really states as we understand it, Israel, Iran, Turkey, and the non-state of the Kurdistan regional government. The rest of them do not have the anchors that nation states have. Furthermore, that region is faced with a traditional millennial approach to world history, an alternative way of organizing society, politics, state, and religion uh, in these messianic uh, caliphate movements that we keep seeing emerging from the Islamic world. This isn't accepted in any serious way by most Muslims, but it is accepted by enough and supported by a few to lead to continuing problems. We have a version of that with Iran and its Viliat i Fakir. We have versions of this with the Muslim Brothers, obviously with Al-Qaeda, and on steroids with uh, ISIS. So it's a tremendous reoccurring problem that we've had to deal with and has led to crisis after crisis, American and Western intervention after intervention uh, since, again, the 1970s, and I don't see any quick end to that. The reason that ISIS is now so different, however, are the uh, elements that have fueled its rise. First of all, the Arab Spring, uh, which laid bare the lack of uh, legitimacy of most of the states in the region and their inability to take almost any action that made sense to their population. They either reverted back to dictatorship of violence, violence most extreme in the Syrian case, or uh, again, uh, basically shut down everywhere but Tunisia. Uh, and that builds up a tremendous amount of pressure. The second thing is the United States. Uh, for many years, rather like the Roman Empire, we would go in, intervene, try to do it with the minimum uh, force, uh, push back the manifestations of this dysfunctionality without trying to deal with the underlying dysfunctionality. Well, in the past mm, 13 years, we've had two experiences, two uh, uh, experiments, if you will, in American foreign policy. Under the Bush administration, we decided no more of that. We don't do base runs. We're going to go in and fix the underlying problems. We know where that has wound up in Afghanistan, uh, Iraq, and Gaza. Uh, then the Obama administration, reacting to that overextension of American power, has decided we're pivoting to Asia. Bye-bye Middle East. Again, those four uh, interests that are absolutely permanent and absolutely vital to us have drawn us back and uh, led to us belatedly to deal with ISIS. Uh, we can get into more detail uh, in the discussion on 
the uh, strategy, the tactics, the operations. There's a lot of this in the news today because of the uh, NATO meeting. Uh, the administration has a plan. Whether that plan will get us from where we are now to destroying ISIS is a very different question. There's a lot about the whole Syrian side of it that Robert knows about far better than me. But even on the Iraqi side, there are issues of where we're going to find the ground troops to actually take territory back from a force that has somewhere between 20 and 50,000 armed people under its control. Uh, and there's also a very troubling uh, uh, term of reference that we need to really consider and look at, and that is the administration's constant hopping on, uh, this is going to be a long-term problem, so we have to deal with it. We've got to mobilize 60 countries. They have, you know, they have agendas and schedules. It's hard to get them all together and uh, all of that. Uh, this is both a truism and it's treacherous. It's a truism because obviously things take time. I mean, even the first Gulf War took us a good number of months to mobilize uh, uh, the international community and our own forces. But nonetheless, time is not on our side with ISIS. Given the situation in the region over the past 15 years, these three new elements, the underlying problem of legitimacy that now is much more manifest with the Arab Spring, uh, the grave questions about American America's willingness to sustain uh, its security role in the Middle East, which is still out there as a problem, and ISIS's threat to everything, I'm not so sure we have a whole lot of time. I'm not so sure it wouldn't be better to take risks, roll the dice, and start pushing harder against these guys now, rather than waiting, and let's just see what happens in a couple of years. A few years ago, when Robert was in Syria, the administration essentially did that lip service to overthrowing Assad, but let's wait and see what happens. Well, what happened? ISIS. I'll rest my case right there. Well, they, uh, thank you very much, Ambassador. <laughs> Ambassador Ford, uh, let me turn it over to you, and there, there are many themes I know that you can pick up from here. Yeah. Um, well, first, Kim, thank you very much, and my thanks to the Foreign Policy Institute um, for the invitation to talk with people today about the Middle East. I after 30 years, I have to say to you, the Middle East surprises me every day. Um, I don't think there is such a thing as an expert on the Middle East. So let me share my ignorance with you. First, the situation today is difficult, and in some ways it's unprecedented, although I don't know if I would call it total chaos. We do have three states, nation states, that in a sense are in meltdown, uh, Yemen, uh, Libya, and Syria. And Iraq sort of teeters in an exciting way. It's always fun to watch. Um, but it, it's, I don't think Iraq's uh, doom is foreordained, and I hope we get to talk about that a bit. Um, as I think about this, I ask myself, what is the context in which these difficulties with these three states uh, is occurring? seems to me that if you sort of think about the Arab uprisings, remember the Arab Spring of 2011, there's a demand by populations from the Atlantic to the Persian Gulf, Bahrain, uh, for dignity. That's the key word. I didn't say democracy. I didn't say freedom. I said dignity, and I mean that. Um, if you carry then that forward, there are two questions or two issues, that would be a better way to put it prisms through which I myself assess these three states. The first is, within this issue of dignity, the first is an aggrieved Sunni Arab population that feels its dignity has been either tread upon or threatened. Um, attached to that then is a a strong impulse towards Islamist parties, which, by the way, are not unbeatable. They just lost a free and fair election in Tunisia. Uh, and so I don't think Islamism is, is foreordained um, as the future of the Middle East any more than secular democratic governments are foreordained. I think it'll be case by case and be specific. We can talk about that. Um, but then attached to this question of dignity and Islamism and role of religion in the state. It's a separate issue, tied but separate, which is the whole Sunni versus Shia competition, which is being played out big time in places like Syria, places like Iraq, Yemen, Bahrain, and even to a large extent in Lebanon. 
these are all issues which it is difficult for the United States to control. We may be able to influence on the margins in some ways, but because they involve fundamental issues of how a nation, individual nation, governs itself, we get into nation building, and having spent, including time with Jim, some four and a half years in Iraq working on nation building, I can tell you from the shoes of a practitioner that it is very difficult and we should treat that with great caution. It's not to say we do nothing, um, but we, we tread cautiously and we have realistic expectations about what any group of foreigners, whether they be Americans or Iranians or anybody else, what they can do to address that. So Jim spoke uh, eloquently about the threat of the Islamic State. And I certainly think it is a threat both to American national security and it is a threat to some of the wobbly nation states in the region now. And there are additional pressures on those nation states. I'm sure many of you are watching the price of oil on international markets. That is going to matter a great deal. It's in some ways a double-edged sword Countries that import oil, like Jordan or Morocco, may benefit, but there will be harder, uh, it'll be harder for their patrons, such as the Saudis, to finance them uh, in the way that they have done. So it, I'm not sure how that's going to cut out. Really important change, which was vividly demonstrated in 2011, is citizens in these countries have greater access to information than, say, in the 1990s or even in the 2000s. Uh, social media is huge and growing in this part of the world. Um, access to satellite information, to the internet more broadly. Um, these are populations which now deal with a great deal more information. Um, that can be positive and it can be negative if we're talking about Islamic State, YouTube, recruiting videos, and I don't know how many of you have watched them, but let me tell you, they're very slick. They are on a whole nother level from what Osama bin Laden was doing 10 years ago. And so the region itself is changing. There are new pressures on it. Um, and we need to address it, but also we need to understand our limitations. Um, and we will need understanding those limitations we will need to find allies both in the region and within uh, the countries themselves because rather than it be an American advocated reform or military step, it needs above all uh, to have buy-in from the local population. Let me stop there, Kim. And well, we'll thank you this. very much. I actually would love to tee up the discussion by asking both of you, given the extraordinary historical uh, overview that you have given in your own ways. Um, if you could sit down with President Obama today and give him three recommendations about what to do in the Middle East, uh, what recommendations would you give him? You get to go first. Okay. Um, one, uh, concerning Syria, do whatever Robert Ford tells you. <laughs> <laughs> Too. Very wise. <laughs> On the Iraq front, uh, we're somewhere between a C and a B so far, but it's still early. Time isn't on our side. Reconsider the uh, no U.S. combat formations on the ground decision because you may have to either renege on that or you may have to fall off of your very important mission of destroying ISIS. I think there's a gap between the two. Three, while you're doing that, and that's hard, and I have some sympathy for the administration on that. Here's where I don't have sympathy for the administration. If we're going to do this seven-point program, and you just heard another iteration of this at uh, NATO, cut off flow of funding, cut off, do something about the ideological appeal, cut off uh, people uh, traveling there, take care of the refugees, uh, airstrikes, build up forces, go on the offensive. Uh, if you're going to do that, without U.S. ground troops, but rather we're going to do this from the air with other people's boots on the ground, we better put, like we've done in every other conflict I know of, advisory teams on the ground, uh, uh, joint tactical 
uh, forward air controllers, and other groups. These are small numbers of highly trained professionals, but they would be at some risk. But they will make all of the difference going out there with Iraqi forces, be they Peshmerga, be they these National Guard or awakening Sunni Arab tribal uh, levies, or be they the Iraqi army, the nine uh, brigades we're forming. There's a huge difference between how these people perform and how people in other conflicts such as Vietnam perform when you have American advisors with them and how they perform without them. We don't have the luxury of uh, having them perform in an inadequate way. So that needs to be done right now. And I don't understand why the administration is dragging its heels when it hears from Dempsey, it hears from others that this is something that should be and is being contemplated. So that's it. Ambassador Ford, your three recommendations for President Obama. Uh, the first would be within the region itself to prioritize. Um, I think most everyone would agree that Syria and Iraq are probably the two highest priorities because of the Islamic State, but also because of the strain that the conflict is putting on other countries that are friendly to us, such as Jordan and Turkey. So that would be the first, prioritize. Second. Um, and I, uh, Jim's laid out a series of military steps. I would say, in addition to military steps, there needs to be a regional political effort at a higher level. It is very clear that we and the Turks are not on the same page about Syria, and I don't think we're fully on the same page about Iraq. And with all due respect to colleagues in the career diplomatic service who, with whom I shared a career, that is not something that an American ambassador in Ankara is going to be able to fix. We're not on the same wave with the Saudis fully as well. And that is not something that the American ambassador in Riyadh is going to be able to fix. That is going to require some high level time, bandwidth is the expression of the day in Washington, uh, here working with the leaders in those countries to come to an agreement on not only the Islamic State, but a whole broader set of issues related to nation states and stability versus reform. Um, we've already sort of worked at cross purposes in places like Egypt. Um, that shouldn't happen again. That should not happen again. And so there's got to be prioritization, second, higher level engagement consistently. And then my third bit of advice to the administration would be don't give up on reform and greater respect for human rights, but understand that you will have to balance it. You'll have to balance it with security issues. To my mind, looking at the Arab Spring, you don't have to have a big bang and create democratic governments in six months. You do need to have gradual, visible improvement so that this aggrieved Sunni Arab population that I was talking about has a sense that little by little things will get better, whether that be beginning some measures of accountability, even at a low level, for police abuse, um, whether that be um, allowing some, not all, some NGOs a greater freedom of maneuver in these countries. Um, different countries are going to move at a different speed. The Tunisians are clearly moving at a faster speed than other countries. Um, that's fine. Um, I think it would be a mistake for the Americans to ignore human rights in the rush to security policy and the fight against the Islamic State because the Islamic State in part comes out of grievances, human rights abuses committed widely by the Assad regime in Syria and by the previous government in Iraq. That's where it came from. So you can't ignore the root causes even as you address very reasonably the counterterrorism policy. The trick is to find a balance and accept gradual improvement on the human rights. It doesn't have to be fast. We don't need Bahrain tomorrow to become a full parliamentary democracy. We do need to see step-by-step -step improvement along with counterterrorism efforts. 
Thank you, Ambassador. I think uh, the two of you have set us up well for questions from the audience uh, with a number of interesting and provocative statements. And so it is my pleasure actually to call on members of the audience. Let me ask you to do the following things if I call on you. First of all, uh, please wait for the microphone so our guests on C-SPAN can listen to your question. Uh, secondly, please. Phrase your question in the form of a question. Uh, and please make it short so we can hear from our two distinguished ambassadors uh, and get their insights uh, into this situation. Um, and we will actually start with the gentleman in the back in the brown coat. Yes, thank you. Please uh, introduce yourself, too. Sure. Uh, my name is Jay Hallen, part of the FPI uh, Alumni Leadership Network. And I also served in the Coalition Provisional Authority in Iraq about 10 years ago. So spent some time over there. Uh, my question is about Iraq uh, to Ambassador Jeffrey. Why is it still it, the administration's policy to, um, to maintain Iraq's territorial integrity, especially with regards to the Kurds, given everything that they've done with ISIS? Obviously, they've been our, our best allies. They, we could open a base there tomorrow if they were independent, and now that they have they're selling oil to Turkey. Turkey practically recognizes them as their own state, and Turkey now has a truce uh, internally with the PKK. Why is it such a problem with our administration? You know, I just heard Kerry talking about this recently about Iraq's territorial integrity. Thank you. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, and as someone who always feels much more comfortable in Erbil than I do anywhere else in Iraq or much of the Middle East, I have a lot of sympathy with people who pose that question. But I can't think of anything that would be more deleterious to everything we're trying to do in the Middle East than to that. Now, if Iraq falls apart, we have to have a plan B. But it hasn't fallen apart yet. In fact, it's kind of uh, gathered itself up and uh, is holding together. With a lot of help from the United States, uh, particularly politically with a new government. Uh, several points. First of all, uh, the United States has to stand for something in this world. In fact, we stand for a lot, and that's behind almost everything we do. Uh, and one thing we do stand for is a nation-state system. We don't look lightly at nation-states that break up, partially because of the underlying legal issues involved, partially because of the practical problems that ensue when, for example, Yugoslavia breaks up. Uh, the first problem is, uh, what would we, where would you put the southern border of uh, New Kurdistan? That's a question to you. I like questioning no, the answer. <laughs> it's fine. I, I know that there's a, a framework for an election on the status of Kirkuk. I know there's a group at Georgetown, some center that's... Uh, that, that studies that issue closely. I don't think that's so insurmountable. I think that they could come to an agreement on, on a border or, or some kind of oil share. I mean, they, could, they agreed this week on some kind of oil sharing. I don't see why they couldn't come to a comparable agreement on the border. OK, two reasons. I mean, there are, there are many other reasons. I just picked the easiest one from my standpoint to rebut your argument, um, <laughs> and that is the borders. Uh, boy, if they could come to some with some group from Georgetown or uh, you know the Sorbonne flying in to fix this, that would be the first time in my 40 years of experience, maybe we can throw in Robert's 30 years of experience, <laughs> in conflicts all around the world from Kashmir to Cyprus where somebody has fixed a border. The problem is particularly in violent, destabilized regions, people identify with their own kind, whether we like it or not. And those are mixed areas with Turkmen, Christians, Yazidis, Kurds, Shia Arabs, Sunni Arabs. They all have their own agendas. All of the groups think each other group's presence there is illegitimate, and I could spend hours talking about, from the standpoint of each of them, why all the others should just go away. Well, they're not going to go away. They're going to pick up guns and fight and create the bloodiest of borders in the Middle East. That's the first problem. Second problem is I'm not only a former ambassador to uh, Iraq, I'm also a former ambassador to Turkey. Uh, Turkey, for various reasons that we could get into, uh, is very close to this current Kurdistan regional government, and oil and gas has a lot to do with that. However, if there's one thing that the Turks will draw a brutal line on, and we just saw this in their reaction to Kobani, is anything that smacks of Kurds getting together on independence. They will never support it. 
that would bring down the Erdogan government, however popular it is, in a heartbeat. And whatever our problems with that government, we don't want to destabilize Turkey by pushing an uh, independence uh, line. So I would say we certainly should go no further than Turkey on uh, autonomy or independence for Kurdistan. And the Turks are on the record in all kinds of ways on that one. My good friend, General Upfront. Thanks, Kim. Um, the, the topic of this conversation and this entire conference is restoring American leadership. Both of you have done a very, very good job, and as have other speakers today, talking about how we see the world. Tell us how you think the Middle East sees the United States right now in the role that the United States can be, should be, and will be playing in the future. That's to you, Robert. Who wants that? Robert. I'll start, uh, Jim. <laughs> I hate to be the bearer of bad news. No, I'm, I'm serious. I think, uh, and there are opinion polls done by very reputable groups, such as the National Democratic Institute and uh, the Pew Research Organization. The public opinion towards the United States, from Morocco to Oman, is extremely negative. It has something to do with our longstanding positions on the Middle East peace process has a lot to do with Iraq and the American uh, war there. Uh, it has to do as well with perceptions of the American stance on Islam in general. Uh, there is real anger uh, in Syria, a place that I spend a huge amount of time on, uh, that the Americans seem to be more concerned with the Islamic State, which has killed, and it is a brutal organization, very bloody, probably killed three to 5,000 people. Uh, but the Assad regime has probably killed 150,000. And so why, they ask, are the Americans so concerned about the Islamic State and not about a regime that has probably killed at least 30 to 50 times as many people? So that is a problem. And that is not something which mere uh, public diplomacy, to use the State Department's lingo, that is not a public diplomacy problem. That is a policy problem. And it will require, I think, some fairly, number one, um, some fairly serious thinking here about where we are going in the region. And uh, are we moving in directions that lead to new opportunities down the road? Uh, and then second, it's again going to take some pretty serious engagement. Starting at the top, embassies will have their work to do in this as well, explaining our vision, our vision, how it is compatible with people there in terms of dignity, and how we can help, but understanding that these are their countries, their societies, and that ultimately they, not us, are responsible. And so we are working to help empower them, but ultimately these are their choices for their future. Ambassador Jeffrey, do you have anything you wish to add? Very, very quickly, uh, having been held accountable for lousy polls in several countries I was in, we never are going to do well in polling. Uh, and exhibit A for that is, after getting tired of bitching from Washington, both in Ankara and in Baghdad at our you know, below 20% uh, favorable ratings, counting the Kurds, uh, who were overwhelming in favor of us, like, kind of like, sort of like Berlin is, uh, I then asked the question, OK, let's see what the polls say about Iran. And in both countries, Iran was right down there with us. Here is my theory. Among populations, no foreign country that's powerful is ever going to be a winner because it makes people nervous, regardless of what we say or do. Our goal should be, and boy, does this fly in the face of much of what Washington puts out these days, is the political thinking elites to convince them. That's what we did in Europe. I spent nine years in Germany, and believe me, most Germans other than Berlin are not all that loving of us either. But the political elites were, and they made the difference because the people followed them. If we have the right policies, as Robert said, then we will do a lot better among those people if they feel they can count on us. If we get back to being there, I hate to say it, 911, and we're reliable. Uh, we'll find the people who matter, uh, and that goes well beyond governments, but it isn't uh, the entire population polled, uh, will basically uh, be willing to uh, meet us halfway. 
All right, terrific question. Um, I will go to the woman here in the third row back. Please do introduce yourself and ask a great question. Ann Pierce, I'm an author, and uh, I was asked to repeat a question I asked in the first panel, so here goes. Um, there's a compelling argument against fighting ISIS without also forging strong strategy to contain and thwart terror-sponsoring, WMD-proliferating, atrocity-committing states, Syria and Iran, and without also putting an end to the brutal Assad regime, one of the worst the world has ever seen. So my question is, is grand strategy at risk in the fight against ISIS, given the ways that that fight benefits Iran and Syria? That is an interesting question, and I uh, tee it up uh, to the ambassadors with some interest. Sure. Yeah. I'll, I'll... Um, to be very blunt, it is impossible to contain the Islamic State in even Iraq without also dealing with Syria. If nothing else, the Islamic State having deep strategic depth in Syria will enable it constantly to be a problem in Iraq. Let me just give you a little historical context. Jim and I were in Iraq during the war there. When we were trying to shut down that Syrian-Iraqi border, we never were able to do it, never, let me say this again, never were able to do it without somewhere between three and four American combat brigades in the province of Anbar, which is the most western province of Iraq, and in the province of Nineveh, Mosul, which is to the north of Anbar, northwestern Iraq three to four American brigades plus four loyal Iraqi army divisions. A total of roughly, roughly 20,000 American soldiers plus 40,000 Iraqi soldiers. And even then, it was always a challenge. So now we face, frankly, a group more capable than the Syrian military intelligence that was causing us problems during the Iraq war much more capable group. Without dealing with the Syrian side of that border, I don't see how the strategy in Iraq can be a success. It will certainly make some gains, as it ha and we have had gains in Iraq. Let's, there is a little bit of good news from Iraq on the military side. The Islamic State is losing ground northeast of Baghdad, south of Baghdad. Uh, it's actually retreating. That's good. However, it hasn't yet been fighting in the Sunni heartland. Mm -hmm. And when it gets to the Sunni heartland, those Shia militias that have been making the progress northeast of Baghdad and south of Baghdad, when those Shia militias start interacting with Sunni populations in places like Mosul and Anbar provinces, look out. There we will have a problem. This gets back into what I was saying about the human rights issues, and you can't ignore them even as you deal with a counterterrorism issue. On the Syrian side of the border, I have to tell you, it is so bad now that options that would have, I think, been quite useful three years ago, with the passage of three years and two years, um, it's much more difficult. But I go back to the most fundamental issue about containing the Islamic State in Syria. It is not something which drone strikes or F-16 strikes is going to contain because the Islamic State, let's face it, A, it's a state. I, it drives me crazy that Washington won't say that. It is a state. It has an administration. It has an army. It controls territory. It runs schools. It runs hospitals. It runs an energy sector. It's a state. And deal with that. That's a bigger threat even. So you do not destroy a state just with drone strikes. You are going to require boots on the ground. I sincerely hope myself that we do not have to have American boots on the ground in Syria. I spent four and a half years in Iraq trying to get an Iraqi government stood up so we could get American boots out of Iraq. But then we need boots on the ground. 
there needs to be serious thinking here in Washington about whose boots on the ground those are going to be. Do you think Assad has the boots on the ground? Or is it going to be the people against Assad? There aren't a lot of other options. So I would submit to you just the grim reality of Iraq, of Syria after three and a half years of horrible war of attrition. The Assad regime does not have the manpower to take on the Islamic State. That's why it had a, basically an indirect truce with the Islamic State for the better part of two years. So they don't have the manpower. So we're going to have to look at the people that are fighting against Assad. And this administration idea that the, the Free Syrian Army is going to fight the Islamic State without fighting mm -hmm. the Assad regime, I have to tell you, there's a, the word fantasy gets thrown around a lot on Syria. That is the biggest fantasy. So, end of speech, I will get off my soapbox. <laughs> Ambassador Jeffrey, um, might you expand the comments to talk a little bit about whether, in fact, the United States is perhaps inadvertently empowering Iran vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, other states in the region through its counter Islamic State uh, policy in Iraq and in Syria. I was more worried about that until the 24th of uh, last month uh, than I am now because I felt that uh, uh, there was a uh, major push for uh, an agreement on almost any terms with the Iranians on the nuclear account, but fortunately the Iranians uh, saved our own bacon, so to speak, by refusing on almost any terms an agreement. Uh, and so now that particular momentum is no longer with us, and I think that the Iranian airstrikes in Iraq uh, over the last several days are an indication that the Iranians sense this and want to uh, cause a little bit more trouble. In a way, that's a good thing. The Iranians and Assad are not, as Robert said, our allies. First of all, on practical terms, they're not going to liberate Sunni Arab areas. Uh, they're just going to be massacred themselves and massacre the locals. Secondly, we don't need them. We and our 60 allies who were up in uh, Brussels have enough forces, have enough money, have enough capability if we mobilize ourselves and do it right. Again, uh, as General Kim had said, with American leadership. I'm normally I'm wary of that term, but uh, uh, in that regard, we can do this, and we don't want to do it with them because, to get to your core question, at the end of the day, and that's the point I was trying to make at my in, in my introductory comments, Assad, and particularly Iran and ISIS, are manifestations of the same problem. Alternative universes. China, and you're going to talk about Russia later today, they're big problems, part because of their power. But they're they want to modify the Westphalian system, tweak it to be regional hegemons. But they exist within the same reality world that we do. There are people in the Middle East, including the Iranians and uh, uh, and the Iranians are the driving force behind Assad and ISIS that have an alternative universe view of the world. And they can never be our allies. So it's a question only, as Robert said, of prioritization. Priority right now is ISIS. All right. Uh, we have a question uh, from the gentleman in the second row. And the microphone is coming. Captain Cooper, Africa Command, with my colleagues here. Good to see you again, gentlemen. Uh, something that every region is faced with, and you all have the perspective. I want to piggyback off of General Kimmett's question. Accounting for capabilities and will of states, of partner states, be it real states or Potemkin states, and looking at, you both mentioned engagements and opportunities, have you all seen from your perspective as chiefs of mission an increasing aversion to risk? And is that potential aversion to risk, a risk to implementation on the policy side, all the way down to a tactical level? Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> the obvious one being not putting advisory teams out uh, with uh, trained and competent and capable units. You have to be a little bit careful. You don't risk people for no reason. But uh, we had this very effectively in Vietnam. I was trained as one. Uh, and. Uh, uh, it's the normal way to do things. AFRICOM, of course, is famous for having advisory teams all over uh, the region. Why not have them in Iraq, where we've got huge uh, uh, issues in play? The only thing I will say is, because I don't want to be uh, too negative to this administration, which is 
uh, justly often accused of risk-adverse behavior. Uh, the risk-adverse behavior flows from the mistakes we made from 2001 and particularly 2003, uh, including uh, the Obama surge in Afghanistan, where we thought we could make a huge difference by putting hundreds of thousands of American troops on the ground in a clear hold build. We did the clear and hold because that's what American troops are good at. We couldn't do the build. That was the point Robert was making, and I was there with him watching this. And we're not going to do the build. If we're your exit strategy, you don't have an exit strategy. And that's been a long and very, very painful lesson, not only for the American military, but for the American people. So they're risk adverse, as the Pew and the Chicago Council on Foreign Affairs uh, surveys have shown repeatedly at the lowest level ever. It's now come up because of the beheadings, but only because of them. And so uh, it's not a good environment for presidents to get uh, uh, to take big risks. Wonderful. Good, good time for additional questions. In fact, I will ask the gentleman sitting behind the gentleman that I called on, uh, please, to ask his question. Thank you. Uh, Carl Golovin. This is a, in a bit of a broader context. Uh, after the U.S. ended its uh, obligations under Bretton Woods in '71 to redeem U.S. dollars in gold by, accumulated by uh, foreign governments, we substituted essentially the petrodollar, where now 40% of the world's oil we require it continue to be sold only in the U.S. dollar, which maybe incurs some resentment around the world. Um, to what extent are we committed to staying in the Middle East to enforce the petrodollar agreement? For example, Iraq had broken with it, begun sold its oil for euros, and Libya wanted to begin selling its oil for, do for, uh, for gold. Um, might we restore a new Bretton Woods agreement and you know, make steps towards a more peaceful world in that way? Perhaps I could ask the ambassadors, to what extent uh, have, have you found uh, that US policy that you've had to execute has been primarily uh, about oil politics vice these geopolitical issues that you've discussed? Uh, almost entirely geopolitical, although energy is Part of it. First of all, I would challenge, although I'm not a financial economist, I would challenge the idea that we have a formal agreement uh, that uh, oil is denominated in dollars. That happens to be a practice. It's just like wide-bodied aircraft tend to be sold in dollars. There are people, the Chinese to some degree, the Russians and others, and the Iranians who are trying to undercut that. But there are many reasons why the international financial system, which rather like euro dollars back 40 years ago, is created by American actions, but not specific American actions, has led to something based upon our economic strength, our role in international financial markets, and on and on, that not is not necessarily in our favor, but it's just out there. But it certainly isn't any sort of plan, or, nor is it a specific agreement. The point is, the United States took a decision after World War II, when communist uh, labor unions, egged on by Stalin, were uh, freezing Europe in the winter of, I think, 46 or 47, that uh, oil from the Middle East was absolutely essential, not for us, we were exporting oil at that time, but for our allies in Europe and eventually the Far East. That has created a, an integral part of the entire global geostrategic situation because our allies and friends who we rely on, Korea, our other, uh, Japan and such, and Europe, are almost entirely uh, hydrocarbon devoid. We're in pretty good shape, particularly now, and always have been in fairly good shape, but they aren't. And the only place that those hydrocarbons can come from is a very unstable part of the world, the Middle East. So that's part of the entire geostrategic um, global relationship that we have had for 60 years. It's not to advance the interests of American oil companies or to advantage our economy in any way. It is basically to ensure that our allies remain economically strong, can stay democratic, can provide military forces to defend themselves and ally with us in places like the first Gulf War. And I see it as a very legitimate and important part of our global policy. All right. Um, yes, absolutely. I'm sorry. Just, I, let me share a little of my personal real world experience. I was also the American ambassador in Algeria, um, which is a major energy exporter, um, including some energy exports to the United States. Just in the sort of the day to day work of what we did, as well as our development of, of sort of uh, policies that we would 
we would use with the Algerians. Uh, energy did not figure particularly highly because the American companies in the sector were doing fine. They worked directly with the Algerians. They didn't normally need a lot of, of help from us. And in fact, we spent much more time um, trying to uh, introduce American companies to the Algerian market. And, and we had some success with a major US industrial company that built a, um, a huge water desalination plant that supplies the capital of Algiers about one third of its drinking water. It's a very big joint venture project with, uh, between that American industrial company and uh, Algerian partners. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't assume even in a place like Algeria where energy is a huge economic factor in the bilateral relationship that it actually sets the tone uh, for the bilateral relationship. I don't, I don't think it does. If, it, if the companies are happy, I think the government's inclination is to stay out. Second point, just in the, in the short term now, as we see energy prices dropping and the American economy doing relatively well compared to Europe and even Chinese growth is slowing, I would be surprised if Gulf exporters would be particularly keen to shift oil sales out of dollars and into other currencies, certainly not yen, certainly not Chinese yuan right now, and probably not euros. So I think they'll be happy, at least in the short term, keeping it in, in dollars. I don't see that they would have a, an immediate commercial advantage. You know, it was different some 20 years ago when they were thinking about changing the basket, but, but I don't think they're thinking that way now. I know that we are running out of time on this panel, so I would actually like to ask uh, the ambassadors for one, one big takeaway. Uh, if you could um, predict for us, uh, use your, your analytic powers to forecast for us uh, where you think uh, these crises in Iraq and Syria uh, will be, um, let us say, six or eight months from now as uh, the Foreign Policy Initiative is putting together its program for its next conference. Where do you think uh, we will have gotten to uh, in these respective struggles? My hope is we will be no worse off than we are now. I suspect that uh, we will have contained uh, ISIS pretty well, as Robert said. Uh, we are on the offensive a bit in areas like Beijing uh, and in the Sunni belt to the south of uh, Baghdad, but I don't see either Mosul or Fallujah being taken. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, we will be at that point really questioning what our policies are. The other unknowable uh, is Iran and how Iran is going to react to uh, the uh, situation not only with ISIS, but the fact that they no longer have, they're going to be uh, under long term sanctions. It's I don't think we're going to get an agreement in seven months. And um, how is it going to react? It's another destabilizing force, and they're growing in intensity in the region. Terrific. Ambassador Ford, do you have a different prediction? I can imagine we might be slightly better off in six months in Iraq. Uh, there's already been some progress on the Kurdish Baghdad issue um, with at least a preliminary agreement about how to manage the oil export question and federal budget. Although Iraq, because of these falling oil prices, Iraq's going to have mm -hmm. a budget deficit very different from anything we've seen before. So it's going to be a challenge for our Iraqi friends. Um, I actually think things in Syria will go from very, very, very bad to even worse still. Um, I presume many of the people in the audience know that uh, the United Nations relief agencies are running out of money. And they're actually cutting back rations. Uh, to Syrian refugees in neighboring countries. That is going to cause um, further difficulties in those countries. We're going to have some very unhappy refugees. Um, the region has experience with unhappy uh, refugees in previous places. Uh, and I see nothing inside Syria that promises in the next six months, Kim, uh, that the situation is going to get better. And that suggests to me that the Islamic State is going to consolidate its hold over the half of the country that it already controls. Um, it is actually on the offensive right now, both north and south of Damascus. Uh, and if things do not change, I would expect that the so-called moderate opposition in Syria, and I do think there is one, I think it will cease 
to exist in northern Syria. And we will simply have jihadis in the north and they're facing the regime, which will make any effort to contain the Islamic State even harder than it is now. Thank you very much. Please, audience, join me in thanking uh, Ambassador Ford and Ambassador Jeffrey. It, it was so cheerful. Chris. <laughs>